the Northern Lord sat opposite, with Catelyn and Rob facing her brother across the tables. They were fewer. The Great John sat at Rob's left hand, and then Theon Greyjoy, Galbert Glover, and Lady Mormont were to the right of Catelyn. Lord Rickard Carstark, gaunt and hollow-eyed in his grief, took his seat like a man in a nightmare, his long beard uncombed and unwashed. He had left two sons dead in the Whispering Wood, and there was no word of the third, his eldest, who had led the Carstark spears against Tywin Lannister on the Green Fork. The arguing raged on late into the night. Each lord had a right to speak, and speak they did, and shout, and curse, and reason, and cajole, and jest, and bargain, and slam tankards on the table, and threaten, and walk out, and return sullen or smiling. Catelyn sat and listened to it all. Roos Bolton had reformed the battered remnants of their other host at the mouth of the causeway. Sir Helm and Tallheart and Walder Frey still held the twins. Lord Tywin's army had crossed the trident and was making for Harrenhal. And there were two kings in the realm. Two kings and no agreement. Many of the Lord's bannermen wanted to march on Harrenhal at once, to meet Lord Tywin and end Lannister power for all time. Young, hot-tempered Mark Piper urged the strike west at Castle Rock instead. Still others counseled patience. Riveron sat athwart the Lannister supply lines, Jason Malister pointed out. Let them bide their time, denying Lord Tywin fresh levies and provisions while they strengthened their defenses and rested their weary troops. Lord Blackwood would have none of it. They should finish the work they began in the Whispering Wood, march to Harrenhal, and bring Roose Bolton's army down as well. What Blackwood urged, Bracken opposed, as ever. Lord Jonas Bracken rose to insist they ought to pledge their fealty to King Renly, and move south to join their might to his. Renly is not the king, Rob said. It was the first time her son had spoken. Like his father, he knew how to listen. You cannot mean to hold to Joffrey, my lord, Galbert Glover said. He put your father to death. That makes him evil, Rob replied. I do not know that it makes Renly king. Joffrey is still Robert's eldest true-born son, so the throne is rightfully his by all the laws of the realm. Were he to die, and I mean to see that he does, he has a younger brother. Tommen is next in line after Joffrey. Tommen is no less a Lannister, Sir Mark Piper snapped. As you say, said Rob, troubled. Yet if neither one is king, still how could it be Lord Renly? He's Robert's younger brother. Bran can't be Lord of Winterfell before me, and Renly can't be king before Lord Stannis. Lady Mormont agreed. Lord Stannis has the better claim. Renly is crowned, said Mark Piper. Highgarden and Storm's End support his claim, and the Dornishmen will not be laggardly. If Winterfell and River Run add their strength to his, he will have five of the seven great houses behind him. Six, if the Aarons bestir themselves. Six against the rock. My lords, within the year, we'll have all their heads on pikes. The Queen and the Boy King, Lord Tywin, the Imp, the Kingslayer. Sir Kevin, all of them. That is what we shall win if we join with King Renly. What does Lord Stannis have against that, that we should cast it all aside? The right, said Rob stubbornly. Catelyn thought he sounded eerily like his father as he said it. So you mean us to declare for Stannis, said Ed Muir. I don't know, said Rob. I prayed to know what to do. But the gods did not answer. The Lannisters killed my father for a traitor, and we know that was a lie. But if Joffrey is the lawful king, and we fight against him, we will be traitors. My lord father would urge caution, aged Sir Stebron said, with a weasley smile of a fray. Wait, let these two kings play their game of thrones. 
When they are done fighting, we shall bend our knee to the victor or oppose him as we choose. With Renly arming, likely Lord Tywin would welcome a truce and the safe return of his son. Noble lords, allow me to go to him to Harrenhal and arrange good terms and ransoms. A roar of outrage drowned out his voice. Craven! The great John thundered. Begging for a truce will make us seem weak, declared Lady Marmont. Ransoms be damned, we must not give up the Kingslayer, shouted Rickard Carstock. Why not a peace? Catelyn asked. The lords looked at her, but it was Rob's eyes she felt, his and his alone. My lady, they murdered my lord father, your husband, he said grimly. He unsheathed his longsword and laid it on the table before him, the bright steel on the rough wood. This is the only peace I have for Lannisters. The great John bellowed his approval, and other men added their voices, shouting and drawing swords and pounding their fists on the table. Catelyn waited until they had quieted. My lords, she said then, Lord Eddard was your liege, but I shared his bed. I bore his children. Do you think I love him any less than you? Her voice almost broke with her grief. But Catelyn took a long breath and steadied herself. Rob, if that sword could bring him back, I should never let you sheathe it until Ned stood at my side once more. But he is gone, and a hundred whispering woods will not change that. Ned is gone, and Darren Hornwood and Lord Carstock's valiant sons, and many other good men besides, and none of them will return to us. Must we have more death still? You are a woman, my lady, the great John rumbled in his deep voice. Women do not understand these things. You are the gentle sex, said Lord Castor, with the lines of grief fresh on his face. A man has a need for vengeance. Give me Cersei Lannister, Lord Castor, and you would see how gentle a woman can be. Catelyn replied. Perhaps I do not understand tactics and strategy, but I understand futility. We went to war when Lannister armies were ravaging the Riverlands, and Ned was a prisoner, falsely accused of treason. We fought to defend ourselves and to win my lord's freedom. Well, the one is done, and the other forever beyond our reach. I will mourn for Ned until the end of my days, but I must think of the living. I want my daughters back, and the Queen holds them still. If I must trade our four Lannisters for their two Starks, I will call that a bargain and thank the gods. I want you safe, Rob, ruling at Winterfell from your father's seat. I want you to live your life to kiss a girl and wed a woman and father a son. I want to write an end to this. I want to go home my lords, and weep for my husband. The hall was very quiet when Catelyn finished speaking. Peace, said her uncle Brynden. Peace is sweet, my lady, but on what terms? It's no good hammering your sword into a plowshare if you must forge it again on the morrow. What did Turin and my Eddard die for if I am to return to Carhold with nothing but their bones? asked Rickard Carstark. I, said Lord Brecon, Gregor Clegane laid waste to my fields, slaughtered my small folk, and left Stonehenge a smoking ruin. Am I now to bend the knee to the ones who sent him? What have we fought for, if we are to put all back as it was before? Lord Blackwood agreed, to Catelyn's surprise and dismay. And if we do make peace with King Joffrey, are we not then traitorous to King Renly? What if the stag should prevail against the lion? Where would that leave us? Whatever you may decide for yourselves, I shall never call a Lannister my king, declared Mark Piper. Nor I, yelled the little dairy boy. I never will. Again the shouting began. Catelyn sat despairing. 
She had come so close, she thought. They had almost listened. Almost. But the moment was gone. There would be no peace. No chance to heal, no safety. She looked at her son, watched him as he listened to the Lord's debate, frowning, troubled, yet wedded to his war. He had pledged himself to marry a daughter of Warder Frey, but she saw his true bride plain before her now, the sword he had laid on the table. Catelyn was thinking of her girls, wondering if she would ever see them again, when the great John lurched to his feet. My lords, he shouted, his voice booming off the rafters. Here is what I say to these two kings, he spat. Renly Baratheon is nothing to me, nor Stannis neither. Why should they rule over me and mine from some flowery seat in High Garden or Dawn? What do they know of the wall or the wolf's wood or the barrows of the first men? Even their guards are wrong. The others take the Lannisters too. I've had a belly full of them. He reached back over his shoulder and drew his immense two-handed greatsword. Why shouldn't we rule ourselves again? It was the dragons we married, and the dragons are all dead. He pointed at Rub with a blade. There sits the only king. I mean to bow my knee to, my lords, he thundered. The king in the north. And he knelt and laid his sword at her son's feet. I'll have peace on those terms, Lord Carstock said. They can keep their red castle and their iron chair as well. He eased his long sword from its scabbard. The king in the north, he said, kneeling beside the great John. Mage Mormont rose. The king of winter, she declared, and laid her spiked mace beside the swords. And the river lords were rising too. Blackwood and Bracken and Malister. Houses who had never been ruled from Winterfell. Yet Catelyn watched them rise and draw their blades, bending their knees and shouting the old words that had not been heard in the realm for more than 300 years since Aegon the Dragon had come to make the Seven Kingdoms one. Yet now were heard again, ringing from the timbers of her father's wall. The King in the North! The King in the North! The King in the North!